Amen. The nursery and the pre-K and kindergarten, you're dismissed. Rock Church up through grade five, you're dismissed. Out the back doors to the right, uh, to our children's building. Amen. I want to just acknowledge a couple of people. We have our uh, kind of sons and daughters of the house with us this morning. Pastor Adam and Bethany, if you'll stand, we just want to acknowledge you. They are planting a church in Marietta, Georgia, and uh, things are going well. I want to acknowledge Pastor Seth and Angela, if you'll stand. There are, they're going to be our missionaries. They have planted uh, our Bradenton location, and uh, recently, as many of you know, they uh, stepped down from that, and they are headed to Texas, or actually, he is headed to Texas, and uh, so your prayers are, are, and, uh, are, are coveted for uh, Seth and Angela and their family. Uh, he's with Time to Revive as a missionary. And how many of you know that, you know, and we've done this before, we've done this many times, we've sent people out, and uh, it's a good thing, it's what God desires to do, I believe. And uh, people come to us, uh, and you know, we're not getting out of relationship or anything, but it's just that God has plans, and we're like a stop-off sometimes, where they come, they get trained, refreshed, whatever is needed, and then we send them out into the, the place that God has for them. And it's a good thing. How many of you know it's not about just keeping everybody here? Amen? It's about sending forth. And so, uh, but the relationships don't necessarily change. It's just that they mature a little bit. And so it's a good thing. Uh, I'm just blessed uh, to have them. This is our uh, second step in our growth track that we are uh, initiating. What's happening last Sunday, what's happened last Sunday, happening this Sunday, and it's happening the next two Sundays after this one, are basically classes that are going to be offered then starting in March after the service for newcomers, new, new people that are coming, to introduce them to who Jesus is and to who our congregation is, and to help them discover their gifting, and then to help them find a place in the body. It's a very simple process, but it's intentional. And that's what's important. Today we're going to look at the second step. And that second step is, is con, con, called connecting to restoration. I do just want to say one thing while I'm remembering it. We had talked about doing baptisms. And uh, yesterday morning, uh, Kathy Sherrick, who uh, is our administrative person, uh, but she also cleans uh, in here on Saturday morning. She was in here filling the baptismal and realized the baptismal was not going to stop filling. And it all kind of works together. And so there's water in the baptismal, but it is really cold. Yeah, some of you have been there and it's, you've, you have the scars to prove it. It's like, you know, embedded in your, but, um, and so we called the people that were going to be baptized and uh, they said, you know, I think we'd rather wait till next Sunday. <laughs> they're Floridians and, uh, you know, they're, they're not used to this but uh, no it, it's all good but uh, we are going to do bad but you know I had the thought that maybe there's some of you here or somebody you know that needs and desires to be baptized that hasn't talked to me or Phyllis yet and uh, Pastor Kent any of us but uh, so you can still out now we're, we want to do this regularly so you know uh, it doesn't have to be next week but um, so hopefully we get the baptismal fixed and everything working. I don't know why it's not fixed. It's new. Okay, this is not good. So we're going to call the manufacturer. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, it is what it is. And that's why there's nobody getting wet this morning as far as in the water. Now, in the spirit this morning, it was sweet. Amen. I, I don't know what you were experiencing there. But uh, just what was going on up front here was just powerful. And uh, so... Connecting to restoration means understanding our vision and our values. And there's two basic things that, over, that are overarching for us. The first is that we desire to host the presence of God. And what that specifically means is we desire to host the presence of the Holy Spirit. I have made, and Pastor Nancy, Pastor Kent, and Kirsty, Pastor Gene, and Anita, we've made intentional prayers to God to say, you know, Lord, we want you to be here. If your presence isn't here, anything else is really of little consequence. Amen? Yeah. 
I mean, we can learn and we can grow and we can do all the religious things, but without his presence, I don't believe there's very much going to happen of eternal consequence. Now, with his presence, he can do so much in a moment, so much more than we could even think about or ask, know to ask. And so we desire his presence, and, and I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit later, but you know, we, in our worship celebrations, in our groups, our classes, our training, discipleship, and, and in our personal families and, and, and lives, we desire the Holy Spirit to minister. And so that overrides and overarches everything. We, are, we desire to be a people of his presence. And I believe he's honored that. I believe he's honored that. Many of you are testimony to what God has and can and will do in your life. The second is to be a people of love and acceptance and forgiveness. And what that means is that we love people because of who they are. They are important to God, so they're important to us. How many of you know that some people are, it's easier to, uh, you know, maybe uh, ignore them. It's easier not to love them. Uh, some people, you know, you just don't like. We never said we were going to like everybody, but we said we were going to love everybody. But, you know, we don't get to choose sometimes who God brings us to minister to. We don't get to choose sometimes who God brings through our doors or who they bring, you know, into our workplace. Or, but we desire to love them because God loves them. And the second thing is that we accept them as they are. You know, some people would like to say, well, we're going to accept you if you will do what I ask you to do, or if you will be like I am calling you to be or, or want you to be, you know, and, and how many of you were exactly where you perfected in, in Christ when you came to the Lord? Anybody? How many of you still are not perfected in Christ? Yeah, okay, I thought so. So see, it's very simple. If, if we're not there yet, has anybody arrived Okay, so none of us have arrived, so that means we're all on the way. And we have to give other people the opportunity to walk along with us, even though they might not be where we would like them to be. And that means we accept people. We accept them as they are, where they are. How many of you have a past? Well, I hope you have a past. I, I wonder what... <laughs> I didn't say it was a bad past. I just, yeah, you know, we all have a past, right? How many of you have you done everything perfectly in your past? Oh, Lord, raise your hand. I mean, you know, we haven't. We've all made mistakes. We've all fallen short. And accepting people as they are means that, you know what, this is a safe place to deal with your issues, whatever that may be, they may be. Amen. We're not going to judge you. In fact, that's one thing that gets under my skin when I see people judging other people based on their appearance or based on their past or they didn't do it right or whatever. I, that's that. Well, yeah. Well, I was going to say, I think I'll say that'll get you kicked out of this church. OK. I mean, because, you know, when, when we judge other people based on what they're wearing or not wearing, or we judge other people based on their experience or not having an experience, to me, that, that doesn't matter at the level of personal relationship. And, uh, and, and so, anyway, I could tell you stories, I won't. But um, accepting people as they are and forgiving people no matter what. Now, that's forgiving people in spite of their past, but how many of you have ever been offended by somebody? And the rest of you are what? <laughs> We've all had opportunity to be offended by somebody. The issue, the Bible says, offenses are going to come. It's what you do with those offenses that matter. And are you willing to walk in forgiveness with the, your brothers and sisters that God has surrounded you with. And that's something that we're very committed to. To not getting offended.
And if we do get offended, you know what? We're going to extend forgiveness because we're all imperfect and we're all on the way in some aspect. And we are. We're human. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably irritate you at times. I'm probably going to disappoint you at times. You're going to disappoint me, irritate me, whatever. You know what? That's no basis for breaking fellowship. And so that's a commitment. Now, if people want to walk away from us, that's, that's up to them. But, you know, for us, we are going to extend forgiveness. And how many of you know that that can be hard sometimes? Sometimes you have to swallow really hard, like six times. I mean, you know, it's not easy sometimes. Because some things are very personal. And, and sometimes people are, people, people can be mean. Not any of you, of course. But, you know, <laughs> people, can be, people can be downright ugly sometimes. Downright unlovable. And so that's when the commitment kicks in. I'm not saying you have to go on vacation with them. But what I'm saying is that because they're valuable to God, we love them. And because they need the ministry that I believe Jesus wants to offer through us, we're going to accept them. And we're going to extend his forgiveness to them and our own forgiveness to them. And I like to say no matter what. And that's the core of, 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 of our vision, if you will, that we're going to host his presence. We're going to be a people of love and acceptance and forgiveness. Now, the details of that are what I want to begin to, to talk about this morning. I have 12 foundational values. I'm not going to hit these in depth because we'd be here for a while. But what I want to do is just so you understand what, who it, what we value as a people and as a ministry. And then at the end of this, we're, you're going to have an opportunity, uh, if you desire, you do not have to, nobody has to do anything. We're going to pass out a membership covenant, and we're going to establish a membership here at Restoration Fellowship. And uh, so, the first one of these is truth. And you have these, by the way, in your bulletin. So you can follow along. Okay, uh, we, we, I preempted the bulletin this week and said, I want you to put the 12 values in there. And so Phyllis did that and did a fine, wonderful job. And uh, so the first of these values, and these are not in any sequential order or they're not in any of order of importance. They're all important, but this is just what comes to the fore. The first is truth. We value truth. The Bible is God's word. It outlines the standard by which our attitudes and behavior are to be measured. The challenge is always to bring our lives up to the standard of truth and not adjust the standard of truth to line up with our lives. Biblical standards of conduct supersede all other social and cultural standards. And what that means is that we desire to align our life, to live our life according to the word of God. We believe that the word of God, the Bible, is the truth. It is infallible in that it contains that which God instructs us. And it's not about trying, and we see this in our day, where there are people who say, well, because, you know, doesn't God want me to be happy? And so therefore, well, even though the Bible says I'm not supposed to be doing something or I'm not supposed to be involved in something because I want to be involved in that, I'm not going to, I'm going to discount or disregard that aspect of the word of God. Where the word of God doesn't line up with our lives, guess who I believe needs to change? We need to change. So we line our lives up with the word of God rather than asking the word of God or bringing the word of God down to the level of our experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now we do, don't do this perfectly necessarily. But we're working at it. And so as we see things in the scriptures where that, that we're not uh, submitted to, it's, a, it's on us to walk into that as opposed to saying, well, the Bible didn't really mean that or that's not really you know, the way it's supposed to be. The second value is that of community. And when I say community, I'm not talking about Sarasota. I'm talking about the body of believers. The church is a place to belong. It's like an extended family where each member is responsible to and for one another in accountable relationships. Members of, this, of the church care for and serve one another in an atmosphere of love, acceptance, and forgiveness and live their lives together in most small and large group settings. Now what that means is that we desire relationship. Maybe you've been to other churches where, you know what, you come to an experience, that's, that's good, and then you leave and there's no connection. The strength of any group of people is in its relationships. Relationships to God, 
our relationship to God and relationship to one another. And so we want relationships one with another because there's like 30 or 31 or 32, depending on your translation, of ministries listed in the New Testament that they, they, they loved one another and they corrected one another and they, they were you know, joyful with one another and they one another, one another, one another. They, they, they interacted with life. We want to experience that. I believe our church, particularly in our Western culture, falls so far short of the relational aspect of what God intends for his body to experience. How many of you have a physical body? All right, now who, who didn't raise their hand? I want to see you. All right, we all have a physical body, right? Okay, how many of your hands are connected to your forearm? And how many of your forearms are connected to your whatever this is, you know? There was a song like that, you know. Wouldn't it be a little odd, you know, if, if I walk in the building and my hand walks in five <laughs> minutes later? I mean, just get a picture of that. That'd be a little different. But I think many times that's how it is in the body of Christ. You know, I have gifts and I have purpose. You have gifts, you have purpose, and yet we're not connected relationally. We can't work together if we're not connected relationally. We can't see that dynamic of where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. And I don't believe that's just his presence resting. I believe that's his presence expanding what God has already put in each of us individually, that together we are far greater than the sum of our individual parts. Does that make sense? When we work together, we can experience things that, that God can move in our midst and upon us, in us, that we aren't going to experience just because I'm an individual and you're an individual and we're in the same room. It's about relationships. That doesn't mean we have to be in relationship with everybody in this room or everybody in our body. But it means that we have to be connected. We have to be connected relationally. That's vitally important. The third one is leadership. The pastoral eldership team has the freedom and responsibility to lead the church under the lordship of Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. A presiding elder gives overall direction to the eldership and is responsible to manage the daily activities of the church. Instead of doing the entire ministry, elders are responsible to train and equip people and release them to engage in their callings and their ministries. Now what this means is that we have a leadership that leads we have a leadership that desires to hear from God, experience his presence, and say, this is the direction I sense we need to go. And as we talk about that, then that gets exposed to the congregation. But together, we do that. In other words, we don't have a lot of committees. Well, actually, we don't have any committees. How many of you have ever been in a church where you had committees? How many of you have ever been in a church that had a committee on the committees? The desire is, okay, well, we want to hear from everybody. Well, I don't necessarily want to hear from everybody. I mean, I love you. What I want you involved in is the purpose in, that God has for you. Does that make sense? Now, in that context, yes, I'd love to hear from all you, you know, what, what, your, what your thoughts are, your desires are. What I really want is that you're equipped to do and accomplish and experience what God has equipped you to experience. How many of you know it takes a whole lot more than me as a pastor to do the work of the church? That was a little weak. <laughs> it takes all of us working together to be the body of Christ. And you can take that to the next level. It takes this body of Christ in unity and at peace with one another, connected to other bodies of Christ that are experiencing the same thing, to be the church in a city. And it takes the church in this city connected and unified and at peace with one another to be, to be a force in the region or the state. You can just keep going level upon level. But you know, I just kind of, sometimes I, I find it interesting that as, as leaders, there are many churches that basically they hire a person and then they sit back and that person is responsible to do the work of the church with like 50 or 60 or 80 different bosses telling them what to do. 
I don't see that pattern anywhere in the scripture. It's a very simple pattern. Paul comes into a community. He establishes a, a work. He appoints elders. And then he leaves and does it again. It's a pretty simple process. And yet it requires trust. It requires trust on the part, the trusting of the Pauls. It requires trust on the, the elders. The elders that were appointed were the pastors. The idea of a two-party system where you have, you know, this, this party and, and, and that party, that, that's, that's democratic, but that's not biblical. And, uh, and so all we, we, we tried to simplify this. Let's centralize the leadership. Who has God set in place as, 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 as a, a senior leader? And who has he surrounded him with, with, with other leaders? And then our job is to equip each of us to do what God has called us to do. And that's our basic structure. Now, we have a, an interesting process because, you know, my responsibility is to conduct the daily affairs of this group of people, this organization, to make sure things happen, to make sure things get done. But, you know, when we have a large decision to make, I mean, if we're just talking about, okay, are we going to take the mail out today or not? Well, just take the mail out. I mean, you know, some, I mean, there are congregations that get together and, and, and have a vote on whether to put a, a, a clock in the back of the sanctuary. Do you want a clock to see what time it is? Put a clock in. Do you not? Don't put it in. I mean, it's not a big deal. But when it comes to something that affects the congregation, the whole of us, for instance, and this is hypothetical, this is not happening, but let's just suppose that we had the opportunity to move east of the interstate or something, and somebody wanted to buy this property. Well, that affects all of us. So what we would do is, that would probably come to me first, just because I'm the point person, and I would take it to our elders. Our elders are Pastor Gene, and Pastor Kent, and Pastor Dan from our Bradenton location, and Pastor Seth when he's around as a, as a missionary. So it's, it's five of us. And so we would talk about this. We have this opportunity to go east of the interstate. What do you think? What do you think God is saying? Let's pray about this. Let's consider this. Let's, you know, take two weeks. And if, 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 if we come back together and we just sense the peace of the Lord on this, then we'll proceed. But if we come back together and they're saying, I don't think so. That, I just don't have a, I, that doesn't witness to me. Even though I might be gung-ho saying, yeah, let's do this, you know, bigger, better, whatever. If there's peace isn't in that group of leaders that God has established here, then I, we're not going to move forward with it. But let's say the peace is there. Then we'd get together the leaders, the people that are conducting the ministry, the, the small group leaders, the cell group leaders, the worship leaders, the people that are helping things, the foot soldiers, if you will. And we're going to get them together and say, this is an opportunity that we have. We feel good about it as elders, but what do you think? And we listen. There's a passage in Acts where they, they, they got together and the Bible says it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. To send, and they sent out two from them. And that's what we're looking for. It seems good to us. It seems good to the Holy Spirit. And if we got a piece at that level, we would have a congregational meeting and say, listen, here is what seems to be transpiring. What do you think? And then we'd listen. Probably not going to take a vote. But we'd listen. What are the red flags? What are the good things? We go back together, come back together, talk about it. What did we hear? And then at some point, because I'm the senior leader, I would have to make that decision to say, okay, this is what I'm hearing from God. This is what I'm hearing from our people. This is what I'm hearing from you as leaders. Let's do this. And therefore, the responsibility then rests upon me. Does that make sense? Is that process clear? And we don't have to use it too often. Because when the, once the vision is set, you know, we're not arguing about what to do or where to go or, you know, those kinds of things because it's already been determined. Um, the fourth value is life transformation. Lives are transformed by the renewing of our minds. More than simply knowing about God in the Bible, we must personally know him in an intimate, transparent relationship where we experience forgiveness of sin, freedom from past hurts, and healing of brokenness in our lives through the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit. This is important because all of us have been wounded. 
All of us have gone through situations that have left us changed. And sometimes when we're changed by the presence of God, it's a good thing. But many times when we're changed by what people have done or done to us, we're changed and our attitudes begin to reflect then the ungodly things that have shaped our lives rather than the godly influences. And so we find then we're responding to people not based on what God would have us to respond, but we're responding out of fear, out of a sense of woundedness, out of a sense of insecurity, whatever that might be. And one of the things that's important to us here is that we find freedom from those things because it's very hard for us to experience all that God has for us to experience when we're bound by those attitudes or bound by those insecurities or bound by those things that are not of God. So it's about uncovering them. It's simply about bringing them to the forefront and allowing the Holy Spirit to deal with them. The fifth one is every member a minister. And my son Josh said, you know, you really need to just change the wording on that and say everybody has a place. Because that's basically what's being said here. Everybody has their place. We need each of you doing what God has called you to do, including youth and children, to be actively involved in ministering to one another to build up the local body of Christ. In order for this to happen, each member is encouraged to pursue a path of discipleship thus equipping him or her in his or her gifting and call. Through spiritual gifts and in the power of God, each person is a vessel of love and care and healing. The idea of having a worship service where everybody kind of comes and sits and listens to me, I don't think, it, I mean, there's a part, part of that that, that that is good, it's biblical, we learn, we, we experience things together, but this is not the end all. This is simply a beginning. My challenge to each of us is that we get involved in ministry with those that God is bringing us. That we get involved during the week. That we get involved in classes. We get involved in cell groups. We get involved in those kinds of activities. Why? Because it connects us as a body. But every one of us has a place. God didn't create any of us to simply sit in a chair. If that's what you're doing, that's wonderful. Have a seat. I hope you're comfortable. But understand that God's call is beyond that, is greater than that. It's to be involved in his kingdom work. And to be involved in his kingdom work, I believe, as a local body, together we can accomplish more than any of us can individually. The, th the sixth one is worship. Through worship, we bless God and minister to him. We praise him for who he is through singing and other worshiping arts, the spoken word. Our worship services include celebration, adoration, proclamation, and exaltation. That's a pattern that God gave to Pastor Gerald uh, back in the mid-80s. It's something that is biblical. The Bible tells us to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and praise. We come into to his, his presence with thanksgiving, with praise. That's why we sing fast, loud songs to begin with. And, uh, and, 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 but you know, it, it's, it's about praising God and then entering into worship. I mean, worship is addressing God directly. Very simple. I'm going to get on my soapbox for just two seconds here, if you'll allow me to, because a lot of the worship songs, I believe, that are coming out today, they're great songs. They're very self-me focused. I'm doing this God. I'm doing this to God. I'm doing this with God. I, I, I. How many of you know that true worship says you, O Lord, are holy? You, O Lord, are mighty. You, O Lord, are so high and lifted up and above. And, 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 and something happens. There's a dynamic when the gathered body of Christ comes together and exalts him and lifts him up. I love the song that we sang today. Thank you, Christy. Be lifted up. Who's being lifted up? He is. Be lifted higher and higher. What does it mean? I don't know, but it's going higher and higher. And you know what? God enjoys our worship when it's lavished upon him. There's something holy. There's something powerful. There's something mighty when we come together. And I want to encourage us because some of us grew up in traditions where we're not very expressive. I'm under, I have grace for that. I understand that. But I want to I want to I want to challenge us. Let's get out of our boxes. Let's move beyond our past 
If you've never lifted your hands in worship, just try it. Decide you're not going to lift your hands, just practice it a little bit. Just say, I'm just going to lift my hand up and put it down and see what happens. <laughs> you don't need to tell anybody. You don't even need to tell anybody what you're doing. <laughs> Be lifted up. Oh, man. I'm still alive. All right. You look around and nobody's watching me. Because our worship is, in many ways, it's a very private thing, but it's also a very public expression. And you know what? We just, I just want you to worship. I just want you to, we don't want to experience all that God has for us. Worship is very important. Maybe you've understood that or seen that here. But, um, and you know, what's interesting to me is, I don't know, I guess, because wherever Nancy and I have been, we've always had quality musicians and people that are worshipers. And, uh, and that's been wonderful. And there are people sitting in chairs today that are worshipers and that aren't on one of our teams. And, you know, that's just a testimony. Uh, I've, I've, had, I've had pastors tell me, man, how do you get, I, how do you get so many worshipers? I don't know how many, I, mean, I, 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 I need to count this up, but I've had pastors call and say, would you mind if I talked with such and such about becoming our worship leader? I'm like, oh, not again. <laughs> sure, because they're not my worship leader. And so we've sown worship leaders into a number of different congregations in this community. Uh, that I think is part of our calling as, as a Levitical people, as a prophetic people, uh, to do that. Prayer is the foundational work of the church. In prayer, we discover and are led to accomplish the purpose of God in our life, our family, our church, our community, our nation, our world. Our need to pray reminds us that the vision of God and the work of the kingdom are beyond our own ability to bring to pass. And that, without his help, we can accomplish little. The key part here is that we have to understand that with, apart from him, we can accomplish little. But with him, we can do all things because he strengthens us, that he will do above and beyond what we can even think or even know to ask. And so, sometimes, you know, prayer is the last thing we do when it should be the first thing we do. And so, that's why we've dedicated time and dedicated this sanctuary as a prayer room and we said you know what if you we would love to have you come sometime during the week we, we you know we, we have a there's a lock on this door over here that is like a key code we'll give you the code if you want to come and pray if you just want to come and run around in here no but if you want to pray pray okay if you want to worship if you want to do and minister unto the Lord, that's really what the Bible calls it. We minister unto the Lord. And some like to do that individually. Some, sometimes there's groups that come in. But we want God to be ministered to because he's important to us. And so if you'd like to do that, you can see uh, my wife, Pastor Nancy, uh, because she directs our, our prayer room. And uh, we'd love to have you participate in this. The giving is the next one. The tithe, 10% of one's income. It's the foundation of biblical giving and is given to and distributed by the local church. Faith promise, giving for missions, sacrificial giving for facilities, and compassion giving for the needy are given above and beyond the tithe. While the tithe is given out of obedience to God, offerings above and beyond the tithe are optional. And it'll be given according to ability and desire, and I would even add obedience. Because sometimes God will instruct you to give. The key is the tithe comes to the local church because that's the method then that God utilizes for us as a body to accomplish what he has put on our hearts to accomplish. And so that uh, we believe in that. Um, I can give to personal testimony and say that I would not want to not tithe. I found out this principle that the 90% goes further than the 100% ever did. And I haven't always been a tither. I have been for a long time. 
When God taught me this principle. I, I like you start to give things. You know, we we God has blessed us uh, financially, and in the earlier days, uh, before we had children, Nancy and I, we had waited nine years to have children. We were both working, and so there would be these projects that would come up, and so I'd like to give, you know, to the project. It was wonderful. When God began to convict me about tithing. And when we started tithing, we really saw the hand of the Lord bless our finances. There's all kinds of good things that you can give to. Those are offerings. I believe that your tithe belongs in the local church. So that as God's body, we can do what he calls us to do. Faith. As God's children, we're called to walk by faith, not by sight, being led by the direction of the Holy Spirit and the instructions of God's word. We therefore value hearing God's voice, obeying his directives, and applying the word of God to our daily lives. I believe, and I think we have faith to believe, we value the fact that when we do things God's way, we get God's results. When we do things our way, we get whatever results come. They may be good. They may not be good. And so I'm not going to say a whole lot about this except to say that, you know, we believe that what God has spoken in his word is for today and it is applicable for today. The next one is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been given to demonstrate the church to fulfill the purpose and claim the destiny that God has created us for. We value the baptism in the Holy Spirit to enable us to fulfill all that God intends for us to experience and accomplish. We also value the Holy Spirit's presence and power in every celebration, gathering, life group, and personal relationship. One of the things that I want to propose is that we begin to use the term life group for the groupings that are outside of the celebration. In other words, the classes or the cell groups or the ministries, they're, they're all designed to bring life. And so just as an overarching label, uh, we can begin to use that. Within that, then there's all kinds of things that God is raising up uh, through this body. And we need the Holy Spirit's presence and the Holy Spirit's power in it all. One of the things that I, I, I hesitate to say this because sometimes things change. But after February, I really feel like that we're supposed to begin to focus on the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to begin to focus on that this spring um, as we walk together. Uh, I believe in the Holy Spirit's power. I believe in, in, the, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit because I've experienced it, but because it's biblical. And I want all of us to experience that. Now, some of you have experienced negative things with that. Um, oh, Lord. How many of you have ever been pushed down by somebody when they prayed for you? Did that leave a positive taste in your mouth? No. no. I'm never going to push you down. I don't want you to push anybody down. Because sometimes what people do is they want something to happen, something tangible that they can control to happen so bad that when they begin to pray, that, that, you know, that's what happens. And I'm more of the mindset, if somebody starts to push me, I'm just going to stand stronger. Maybe you're not like that. Maybe you're accommodating. I guess I'm not. Now, at the same time, if God comes upon you, you may not be able to stand. And I've had that experience too. And so, if God wants to lay us all, if the Holy Spirit wants to lay us all out until 3 o'clock this afternoon, wonderful. We'll wake up and it'll be 3 o'clock. But you know what? I'm not going to make anything happen. And I don't want any of us to make anything happen. I want us to be available for God to use so that he can make something happen. Does that make sense? And so part of this is I want us all to be trained to understand how to minister in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. I want us, I want, you know, the pastor shouldn't be the only one ministering up here at the altar. You need to know how to minister when somebody comes to you in your workplace and just starts to talk about, you know, I, I, man, I got this thing going on in my knee and it really hurts and it's all swollen. And, you know, what do you do with that? You know, I got this really cool pastor that I'm going to call and he'll come and pray for you. No, that's, that's not the right answer. You 
have the power of the Holy Spirit resident in you. So I want us to have the confidence and the faith to be able to say, in those kinds of situations, hey, can I pray for you? Would that be all right? If somebody's got a knee that's bugging them, that's painful, that's, you know, they're not going to turn it down. They're going to say, and they may not know what to do with it. Well, yeah, if you want to. You know, it doesn't need to be this holy thou, oh God, please come upon the knee. I mean, you know, no, it's just, Lord, we release your healing into this, you know, 10 seconds. It doesn't have to be a long thing. But what you're doing is you are becoming an instrument that the Holy Spirit can utilize to touch someone else's life. Guess what happens? You know, God heals that person's knee. And guess the next question they're going to answer, ask you. What did you, how did you, what did you do? And then you get to tell them about Jesus. Which is why the time to revive things that we've been going through this last year are so important. Because it gives each of us a tool to know how to witness to what God is already doing. And to simply bring them in to the next step. The work of the Holy Spirit, so important. Final two, outreach. The main focus of the church is to be outward rather than inward. And the local congregation is the main tool God uses to bring transformation to communities. Reaching out to others is not simply one of the things we do, but the focus of everything we do as a church. Extending the kingdom of God both at home and around the world must be at the forefront of our minds in every decision that we make. I have a confession to make. I am not a natural evangelist. It's not something that comes easy for me. It's not something that comes natural to me. Give me a guitar. Give me, let me sing. I'll be fine. Put me on the street corner and I just won't say much. That's why Nancy, God gave me a wife that knows how to relate to people and talk. And, you know, she just goes into situations and, and you know, and, and it's all good. I go into situations and I hang along the side. How many, anybody, anybody, other people here side hangers? I mean, you know, you just kind of, <laughs> some of us are just like that, uh, you know. But uh, it takes the whole body to be the body. And I thank God for those people among us that can go and can minister and can talk to people and can relate to people. You have a gift and you are needed in this body. Now, I learned all of us are called to be a witness. Maybe all of us aren't natural evangelists, but we're all called to testify about who Jesus is and what he has done when we have that opportunity. Does that make sense? And so we need to stand firm. We need to understand who we are. And we need to go looking outward rather than looking inward. Restoration Fellowship is not just about a group of people that gets together on Sunday morning and experiences worship. It's about a group of people that are actively engaged in what God has called us to do out there. In our workplace, with our families, where we recreate, whatever it is that we do, we are called to be the body of Christ. And that's what we want to be. The last one is unity. Working together as a local body of Christ is essential. If we're to accomplish the task that God has for us. We also value relationships with other local congregations and ministries who are like-minded. We also share common vision, values, objectives, and patterns as, local as a local congregation with a broader restoration network of churches. Glad that... Uh, you know, we, we glad that Adam and Bethany are here, that Seth and Angela are here. It's like they're, 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 there's this connectedness that happens. And it's, it's more of like a family. It really is. It's like family that gets you know, sent out into what they have been called to do. And yet we come together and, and we enjoy relationship. We enjoy the fellowship. We're able to minister one to another. It's not just about us. It's about what God is doing through this church through this network it's what God is doing in the broader body of Christ in this community how many of you know that unity is important yes. vitally important to be connected and that's a value that we hold to be connected now very quickly one of the things that I mentioned was life transformation and what that means is that we find freedom freedom from our past Freedom from addictions. Freedom from ungodly thought patterns. Freedom from the things that the enemy wants to continue to keep us in bondage to. 
And we want to be a place of people where those things are broken off of us. You remember our passage from last week, our eyes focused and clear, free from ungodly influences from our past. That's not possible without a relationship with God first. He gives you the power to accomplish this. But I find it interesting, there's the, 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 the ministries, um, you know, uh, it's interesting because we, we've, we've been working at, 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 at what we call restorative prayer for, and Nancy and I have been doing what we call inner healing, and we're going to offer a class on Wednesday on steps to free, on the Wednesday night starting in March, on steps to freedom. There's just different things that God has brought into our midst. And now it seems like, you know, we have other, even what I would call a next level ministries. Uh, Pastor Gene doing recovery ministry on Friday nights. We have Lazarus ministry that comes in on Tuesday and does deliverance. We have another group that's starting to meet on Thursday nights. It's more like um, a, an AA kind of uh, meeting. Uh, it's just, it, there's different things that God seems to be bringing into our realm, into our sphere of influence. You know why I believe that is? Because as we are ready to meet the needs of people, I believe God is going to release people who, needs, who need those needs met. Does that make sense? Why would God release a harvest to us if we're not able to contain it? And I believe that God is readying our body to contain the harvest that he has for us. It's not to discount anything about what God is doing broader than this, but just to say that if you need to be free, if even as I've talked this morning, you realize, you know what, there are things in my life that are not of God. There are things that I need to deal with. And you don't know how to deal with them. Guess what? We know how to help you. We have tools. We have resources. There's an anointing here to bring healing. Amen?